I'd like to personally thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. At Highview Baptist Church, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. We're so thankful that you're taking the time to dig into God's Word with us. And we'd encourage you to check Highview out more on our website at highview.org. We hope and pray that the Lord is speaking to you in and through His Word and that you truly will come to know and follow Jesus. Good evening. So good to see you guys. Man, I just want to tell you first, every time that I have the opportunity to be here with you at Highview Central, it's such a, such a blessing to me. And I just want to thank you just for your kindness, the way that you just always receive anyone who walks in this building. You truly love people well. And every time I hear, I, I'm just loved so well by you guys and just drawn to Jesus. I'm excited about what's going on here at Central and want you to know that we just absolutely are pumped at East Campus to see all that the Lord is doing in and through you, man. And we're just praying, just as even y'all are planning, praying for your Easter service this Sunday. And just praying that the Lord would just do a mighty work in the park. What an awesome opportunity. I'm so encouraged by the outreach and everything that's that's going on. Uh, likewise, I want to thank you, Pastor Scott. Uh, man, I cannot tell you how highly I think of this man. And just had the privilege over the last Five or, five or so years, I guess, to know you. But I truly can say from the bottom of my heart, Scott is an incredible dear friend. Uh, Scott is someone who I'd say is so uh, and such an example of godliness. What it truly looks like to follow Jesus, what it truly looks like to make disciples. I'm gonna tell you what, nobody I know prays like this guy. And I love that that's the influence he brings. And so, man, I love you. I'm just so thankful for you. Man, I look up to you in so many ways and I'm honored uh, to be able to be here and bring God's word. Uh, That is my task tonight is to bring the word, even though I heard a few times already that Terry Dent looked like he was more ready to preach than me. But I'm gonna try. You're looking good, my man. I'm not, not there all the way, but uh, I'm excited uh, to bring God's word. I invite you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to close out this series, The Gospel-Shaped Life, tonight. And I've got to be honest, it is on quite a heavy text, but rightfully so. I don't know about you, but a lot of times in my life I need a, a reality check. I, I, my wife would probably say I need one every day. Uh, but I, in many ways, I think that's what we have <clears throat> in this chapter It is Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of Passion Week. As we look forward to Resurrection Sunday, I hope you're pumped as we're just moving into this season. What a time to celebrate. Uh, There's such a spiritual sensitivity in so many people's lives around here in the Bible Belt that I think is such a great opportunity. But it's Palm Sunday today, and uh, maybe you're not even familiar what Palm Sunday is. It's basically uh, the historic moment where Jesus rides that donkey into the city of Jerusalem. And it was so significant because it was a fulfillment of a clear prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9 that the Messiah, as Zechariah prophesied 500 years before, the Messiah, the king of Israel, was going to come mounted on a donkey, just similar to Solomon did as he ascended to the throne after David. It was a statement of kingship, and people knew what it meant. They didn't get the scope of what it meant. They didn't get how big of a deal the redemption was that's coming. They were mainly focused on what their eyes could see in the political sphere. It was much bigger than that. But of course, in God's providence, we find ourselves, again, talking about another prophecy of Jesus' coming, but not his first one. He's already come on a donkey and he's come to die. He's come to save sinners. And he came on that donkey extending peace. But what Peter's talking about, 2 Peter 3, is he's prophesied to come again. And he surely will. But it's not going to be on a donkey to bring peace. It's going to be on a horse, as Revelation 19 says, to judge and make war. And the question is, are we ready for him? And are those around us ready for this king I don't know what you guys usually do. I think you probably do, but I would ask you if you just stand in honor of God's word. And we will read in 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read through verse 10. This is the word of God. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets 
and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Church, you may be seated. Thank you for standing. If you're following along tonight in terms of an, kind of a direction or outline, I've titled our time in this text, The Judge is at the Door. The judge is at the door. I borrow that language out of James chapter 5, which is an indication of the imminence, of the nearness of Christ's return and our responsibility to live in light of that. And so I want to make two primary points from this text and then a primary point of application. Very simple. The first one is this. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. If we didn't get that from the text, we maybe just didn't, weren't listening at all. Jesus is coming. He's coming to judge. He's not willing, though, that we should perish. But in fact, he is coming to judge the earth. And secondly, with that, and here's the good news, that he is patient. He's patient. He's not slow. He's not bluffing. He's not delaying. He's patient. It's in his timing, but desires our repentance. And so in light of it, we want to be holy, and we want to get on mission. There's an urgency to this. So let's dig in first in this truth that Jesus will judge the earth. Look at verse 1. Peter says, this is now the second letter I'm writing to you, beloved. And both of them, I'm, here's what needs to happen to us tonight. Stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. That's what Peter wants to happen to us in this room. He says, I want you to leave here stirred up, really dwelling on the truths I'm about to communicate. Not me, but Peter's saying these truths that God has spoken. They were stirred up by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. So what does Peter want our minds stirred up by? The scripture. He wants us dwelling upon the promises of God's word, the predictions of the holy prophets. And so here's what we need to know. The predictions of the prophets aren't like predictions of the weatherman, okay? At least I know that from this weekend because it was hailing and snowing and lightning and I don't even know what was happening. I don't think anybody planned that. That's not the kind of predictions we're talking about. We're talking about certain foretellings of events that indeed will occur. The predictions of the prophets like Zechariah that we wrote of, like Isaiah as we will read in a few moments, the words of Jesus delivered through the apostles. So critical to us is the scripture, remembering it, dwelling on it, knowing what is promised about what? About Christ's second coming. That's the context. And why is it so important that he wants us stirred up? Verse three, knowing this, here's why, especially knowing this, first of all, that scoffers, will come in the last days with scoffing. People are going to come mocking, making light of this. Like, oh, that's not going to happen. He's, he's not going to do that. That's a joke. The last days, he said, people come scoffing, joking about this, making light of it, come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Peter wants our minds stirred up by the scripture and remembering because if you're serious about this, you need to be rock solid in the scripture because people are going to be acting like you are absolutely crazy at times. That you are judgmental, that you're hateful, 
that you're not inclusive to those who would want to know the Lord. And here's what's sad is that what you will even find is that there will be, sadly, people who profess to know Christ. Who at times, when you are taking the judgment of God seriously, who will accuse you of being too extreme. But this passage looks pretty extreme to me in what it's warning. There's a gravity to what's being communicated. And so what he's saying is, listen, the scoffers are going to be loud, but the scripture's true. Okay, And no matter how loud it may get, no matter how culture may press against you, no matter the temporal things that are thrust before you, there are going to be a million things that culture is always going to be saying that you need to be consumed with. But Peter says, get eternity before your eyes. And how does it happen? It's you get your head in this book. And you pour over it, and you know it, and you know the scripture, and you read it, and you dwell on it, and your mind is stirred up. What will the scoffers say? He gives us really, I think, what will be said in many ways, but also I think the practical attitude. They will say this. Where is the promise of his coming? I don't know if any of y'all grew up in a lot of environments like I did, but you probably heard it sometime or another. He ain't going to do nothing about it. What are you going to do about it? Peter says this is going to be people's attitude toward God Almighty. And maybe even tonight with the restraint of the Bible Belt, you know, because we still enjoy some of that. Even now, as crazy as the world is, in the Bible Belt, there are certain restraints that there are certain things that are said and aren't said. And maybe you would never, or some people you know would never say out loud that God's not going to judge their sin, but maybe you're living that way. It would reveal, like, do you believe that this is going to happen, that scoffers are going to come scoffing? They're going to say, where is the promise of his coming? Do we fear him? And this is why Peter says, this is what their argument will be, that they're doubting his judgment. Ever since the fathers fell asleep, they will say, or they will reason, he says, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. So, He's saying, people are going to say, you know, ever since the world's been around, it's been uniform throughout history. God hasn't done anything in the past. God's not going to do anything in the future. God hasn't intervened in the past. Therefore, he's not going to intervene in the future. When I was growing up, I, my dad was amazing. He's still amazing. Still, he's in ministry today. And uh, if I was doing something I wasn't supposed to be doing, or I was challenging him in any way, all he had to do is and look across the room. And I know, based on his intervention in the past, he wasn't playing with what he was about to do in the present tense, right? But if you can distance yourself from what God has claimed to do in the past, then you can create a psychological distance with what he's promising that he's going to do in the future. This is why it's such a big deal when you hear comments like, hey, you know, the Bible is a really awesome book and we can learn a lot of things from the example of Jesus, but you know, at the end of the day, not everything's historically accurate. What's happening? That's not merely an intellectual claim. That's a spiritual claim. That's a denial. Why? Because if you can distance yourself from what God has done in the past, you can distance yourself from what he is going to do in the future. Here's what he says. They deliberately overlooked this fact. That the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged of water and perished. What does Peter say? Oh, he's, in, he's intervened in the past. They're deliberately overlooking this fact. And he draws out first an argument from creation. In Genesis 1, the scripture says, God created the heavens and the earth. I would consider that some pretty serious intervention. Right? Like if God doesn't create, you don't exist, I would say that's intervention. But again, what happens when you hear claims of modern philosophy or in scientific disciplines? You know, you know the universe, matter has always existed. It's just, it's just eternal. Those are not merely intellectual claims. Those are claims of belief with spiritual implication. And not just that, he says it was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. Harkens our attention again to the book of Genesis because God didn't just create the world, right? 
In Genesis 1, it doesn't just say he created everything and kind of all the raw materials for the universe and then by happenstance, they kind of assembled themselves together. They kind of just jumped together and, oh man, and there was, then life happened, you know? No. It says the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters and God spoke and said, y'all know it, right? (laughs) Sadiq does. Y'all, let there be light. Like, God created all things, but the account of Genesis would even indicate to us that apart from also acting upon his creation, it would never have been brought into stabilized harmony in a structure that was functional for life. You see, the Lord didn't just create all things. He created all things, and in their chaotic state, by his spoken word, Hebrews 1 verse 3, he has brought it all together and is sustaining all things by the word of his power. God didn't just intervene at creation. God is intervening at every single moment of history right now. You're breathing, your heart is beating, the world is turning, the gravity is working, because Jesus is still speaking. And the moment he stops speaking, we unravel. And then he says, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. He reminds us of the flood. If you need an example of intervention as related to judgment, remember the scripture. He's stirring up your mind is what he's saying. Remember this. God flooded the world and destroyed everything with the breath of life. Except for those whom he placed his grace upon in that ark. He has brought judgment in the past, and that was just a foreshadowing. It was a small picture of what's coming in the future. And so again, why do you think there's such a quickness today to deny a global flood The ark and Noah and all that's happened, it's not merely an intellectual claim. It's a spiritual denial of what's true in order that we can distance ourselves from what's coming. What can we bet on? Verse seven, here's what we can count on. Know for certain, by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire. God won't flood the earth again. He promised in Genesis to Noah and made a covenant that he wouldn't. But judgment will come at the end of Jesus' return by fire. And it's being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Who is the Lord coming to judge? He is coming to judge those who are not found in Christ who are not found in relationship with Christ, who are not washed and covered by the blood of the Lamb. We're all ungodly, just to be clear. We're all sinners in this room. But, man, we long to be covered. But again, he is coming. And listen, here's what I want to do. I just want to stir you up by way of reminder. I want to read a prophet, and I want to read an apostle, because that's what Peter said to do. So I'm going to read you Isaiah 66, the prophet, what he said. This isn't just something that like was come up with in the church, this idea that God's going to judge the world. This has been the belief of the Jewish people for centuries and centuries, before Christ's birth. Isaiah 66, for behold, the Lord will come in fire. And his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger and fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment and by his sword with all flesh and those slain by the Lord shall be many. As I flip over to Revelation, I remind you of the words of Jesus as he said that the Son of Man will come with being sent by his Father with the holy angels to repay each one according to what he has done. And then in Revelation 20, here the Apostle John Speaking of this vision he has, he says in verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The only question that matters in this room is, is your name 
his book. It's his book. Only he can put it there. There's a seriousness, there's a severity, there's a weightiness and a glory to the judgment of God. And if you are fearful right now, good, you're hearing what this says. Don't talk yourself out of the severity of this, but at the same time, don't miss the kindness and the grace that the Lord wants us to experience. Because in all these accusations, ironically, that people utilize to say that the Lord is not going to do anything, it's actually his kindness toward them that they're even able to say that. It's patience. Look at verse 8. Listen to the patience of God. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. Peter says, I want you to be stirred up in your mind to think about the nature of our king. He's not like us. God is creator. We are created. We are dependent upon him for existence. He is self-existent. He needs nothing. His existence is contingent upon nobody or nothing, no power source. He has eternal life in himself from everlasting to everlasting. He is God. He declares the end from the beginning. He has decreed all things. There is no other God beside him. He is it. It's just him. God can do as much in a single second as any of us could do in a thousand lifetimes. And yet at the same time, a thousand years is like but a passing of a moment to him. And what's crazy is whether it's a moment or whether it's a thousand years, he knows every single detail, thought, motivation, inclination of every human heart simultaneously. And so I think what Peter's trying to communicate is this. Let's not be making judgments about the character of God and the word of God based on our frail and finite perception of the passing of time because we probably don't get it. Like he's got it and it's nothing to him. That the passing of time is not, he is not bound within time. He's not confined to time. Yet here's crazy, he took on flesh and became incarnate within time. Yet he's not bound by it. He ordains time. Time has its existence because of him. It's understood in light of who he is and what he's done in his creation. He's right on time. He's right on time. And here's why it's so good that we're not in control of time, okay? Verse nine, the Lord is not slow. Don't ever say the Lord's slow. Don't ever say the Lord's dragging his feet. Don't ever say the Lord's delaying. Oh, he's not doing any such thing. He's patient. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. As some count slowness. Don't mistake the Lord's patience for inactivity is what Peter's saying. Don't mistake his patience for the thought that, oh, God's bluffing. He's not. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but, oh, hear this. And I just, I want, if maybe you've not even been all the way zoned in, I want you to zone in right now. Because this word is for you. I want you to hear it. He is patient toward you. He's patient towards you. He's patient towards me. Praise God. He's patient towards me because I'm a fool apart from him. Just ask Scott. He spent a decent amount of time with me. He'll tell you. He's patient towards you because why? He's not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. And you say, Blake, what does that mean? And I say it means he doesn't desire that anyone should perish. He desires that all people, that you, that me, your family, your children, your neighbors, your coworkers, the people you pass in the grocery store, he's patient towards you. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God is not delaying. He's right on time. And his timing is that of patience because of his love for you. 
He is not wishing that you should perish. And he has most dramatically proved it in that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him, it's open to you, to everyone you know. It's open. God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Here's the proof. You want to know that I love you? I'm going to prove it. You want to know that I'm patient? You want to know that I'm merciful? I'm going to show you. God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever, he invites you. Maybe you need to believe him tonight. Maybe you need to receive Christ tonight. To believe in him would not perish. He doesn't want you to perish and he's not just, he doesn't just like, oh, I don't want that to happen. He made it possible that you might not have to perish. If you believe in the son, you will not perish. If you believe in Jesus, you will not perish. But you will have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. It is that bloody cross of Jesus Christ. If you need to know that God's intervened in the past, that's the strongest statement. Stronger than the flood. His intervention is such that he, God took on flesh and said, I want you to know who I am. I want you to know what I'm like. And what is he like, John 1? He's full of grace and truth and mercy and kindness. As my brother Jake prayed earlier, he says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest for my yoke is easy and my burden is light and in me you can find rest for your souls. He calls and comes and reveals himself and intervenes to show just how merciful, just how much he loves us, just how gracious he is. And he's not just intervened in a sense of taking on flesh. He's again proven his love in order that, in how? God demonstrated his love for us in this and that while we were sinners, not when you got it together, but while we were sinners, he died for us. That is his love. It is unconditional. It's not contingent upon anything you've done. It is out of a sheer act of grace and mercy that he comes to us and demonstrates his patience and offers us salvation by faith alone. And no greater is God's judgment been revealed, even greater than the flood, than what happened on that cross. The cross is the evidence that God does judge sin. And what is so incredible is it wasn't his sin. He's sinless. He never sinned. There is no spot or blemish to the sun. But a debt had to be paid. And I want you to know tonight, and I want you to know for those around you, those you work with, your family, everyone's sin is going to be paid for. Everyone's sin is going to be paid for. And the question is, are you going to pay for it? Am I going to pay for it? Because that's an eternal debt that you can never pay off. In that place we read about in Revelation 20, under the wrath of God, but here's what's so beautiful and amazing is the Lord so loved you and Jesus is so powerful and Jesus' life, according to the book of Hebrews, is indestructible and his life is eternal. When he surrendered his life upon the cross, he paid a debt in a single death that we couldn't pay if we lived and suffered under that debt eternally. He paid it all at once. It's paid, it's finished, his grace is extended and what is he doing? He's patient toward us. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Maybe you need to put your faith in Jesus right now. You're like, I can't wait till the end of the sermon to put my faith in Christ. I would encourage you to do that and say, Lord, save me now. Lord, I believe in you now. He invites us in. Well, we invite others in with this kind of tenacity that he has. It's his grace, because at the same time, hear this, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. He brings us back to remember this. If you're not ready for this, it's gonna be like you're sleeping in your house, only to be awakened in horror because somebody's breaking down your door. And then there will be no mercy. There is mercy extended, but when he comes, there will be none. There will be no mercy granted. There will be no amnesty. There no, there's no peace. He comes like a thief, but he's not a thief. Thieves take what don't belong to them. Jesus is coming to take what's his. The creation belongs to him. 
And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies, this is just wild to me, okay? Heavenly bodies is kind of like a reference relating to the elemental particles of the universe. And he says the heavenly bodies, when Jesus returns, will be burned up and dissolved. His glory is so great that the atmosphere is gonna melt. And the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Are you ready for that? My heart just trembles thinking about it. And I love Jesus and I'm so grateful for his grace and his mercy. But at the same time, I say, Lord, I need you. I need your mercy, God. Only Jesus in your blood. Will we be ready for that day? And when he comes, every work will be exposed. Every frivolous little temporal pursuit that we've engaged in, all our little human accomplishments, all the little approval of man, all kinds of things that we're thinking about, like they're going to be exposed fully. The works that are done on it will be exposed. Everything about your heart is going to be laid bare. Everything that you've done, everything that's going on in the dark, everything that nobody's seeing, It's going to be, and the question is, are we ready for this and it to be exposed? But at the same time, I want to encourage you something. All those deeds that are righteous, that are done in secret, those are also going to be exposed. The Lord sees you. Some of you are really wrestling right now and you're struggling. You're seeking to be obedient. You're battling with all your heart and nobody even sees the fight you're fighting. Jesus sees it. And great is your reward in heaven. And it's going to be exposed. And he's going to be glorified in it. And you're going to be like, yes, I'm so glad that I gave myself to this. Ain't nobody going to be saying, man, I, you know, I should have just chilled out a little more, like take it a little easier. Wow, you know. The only thing that anybody will be saying is, why didn't I give more? Why didn't I give more of myself? What's the application? He draws it out to the end of the chapter. It's to be holy and get on mission. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Here's the charge. Everything's going to be dissolved. So what should we be like in our pursuit of holiness? Is that the cry of your heart? Lord, I see this. I just, Jesus, I want to be like you. I want to be set apart like you. I want you to change me. Jesus, I want to be dependent upon you. Jesus, I want people to look at me and see you, to see your character, to see your kindness, to see your love, to see your grace, but at the same time, Lord, to see your zeal for the truth. Oh, and hear this. Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. What? What? Now, I believe the Lord is sovereign and he has decreed the end from the beginning and he has declared all things for all time. Yet at the same time, in some way of mystery, you and I can affect the day of his return. We can speed it up. We can hasten it through what? Lives of holiness, of godliness, and seeing the occlusion of God's people globally, believing in him, surrendering him, putting their faith to him, and the fullness of God's people come in. When the fullness of God's people come into his fold, he will return. The heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's what we're waiting on. I want to stir your mind up tonight. That's what you're longing for. That's what you're waiting for. It's what is ahead. No more sorrows, no more brokenness, no more tears, no more frustrations, no more anxieties, no more stresses, no more strife, no more violence, no more war, no more questions, no more confusion. New heavens, new earth, dwelling with Christ forever. This is promised to those who believe in him. What kind of people ought we to be of lives of holiness and of godliness and of people Who the cry of our Lord is he is patient toward us that none should reach repentance. That our hearts would be to seek and to save the lost. With the gospel of our Savior. Every single person in this room, you know somebody who doesn't know Jesus. What kind of people ought we to be in holiness and godliness? 
it's time to sh- it's time to tell them. It's time to tell them about Jesus. To tell them the truths of these the scripture, the truths of God's judgment for sin, absolutely, but to speak of his grace, to speak of his blood, to speak of the cross, and that it is by faith alone in Jesus Christ you can be saved. Come. That's our invitation, is to come. How will you respond? Even over this week, leading up to Resurrection Sunday, what an opportunity to share the hope that you have. What do we do into the very end? Just look at verse 18. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Guys, let's get busy being holy, being with Him, being changed by Him, and sharing what He's done. Would you let God's Word change you tonight, to encourage you tonight, to spur you on and give you a boldness tonight and this week to share. He loves us, man. He loves you. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for your grace. Lord, you are so good. Lord, you are, as Psalm 29 says, you are full of majesty. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. God, we've heard your word. May we heed and hear and act upon your word. Being not hearers who forget and who are deceived, but doers who are act and who are saved by faith. Lord, I pray you'd work in us powerfully this week to trust you with all of our heart. And I pray, Jesus, in your name, amen.